Hello, welcome back. I am Anthony Mueller, the Wine Advocate Reviewer for Washington State and South Africa. Today I have a very, very, very interesting guest who's making incredible wine in South Africa. Some fantastic Cabernet blends, some Merlot, some Cab Franc, really, really tasty stuff. So let's see if we can find Mr. Chris DeVries from Villafonte. Hope everyone's having a fantastic Wednesday. <laughs> And there he is. Hello, sir. There. How are you? I'm pretty good. How about you? Fantastic. Cannot complain. It could always be worse. I tell you what. <laughs> Absolutely. Under under the circumstances. For for sure, for sure. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day. I know it's late there, and there are a lot of things happening uh, where you are. So um, for those of our viewers and uh, readers in America and the States, can you? Please give us a quick uh, background about yourself and uh, Villafonte. Absolutely. So I suppose myself, I, I had the, the unique opportunity to um, intern with Villafonte uh, early on in my career. So I built up this, this traction and um, a real passion for red Bordeaux bl uh, blend wines. And um, so I always knew what was the best place in South Africa to, to join? And um, that was Villafonte. So that was in 2014. Mm -hmm. I was busy finishing my, my dissertation, master's dissertation with uh, Stellenbosch University. And um, I spent 10 months with, with the brand. So really got a, a good look inside out. Um, that was where I, I got to meet Zelma and Phil, uh, two of the owners of, of the property. Mm -hmm. And um, through their encouragement, uh, they they really helped me to to get to Opus One in Napa, California. So that was one of my my all time dreams, and uh, yeah, it, it was an incredible experience. Awesome. So I suppose building on that experience from Villafonte, uh, I loved my time in California. Mm -hmm. I was actually set to to go back in in 2016, and. Um, after coming to, to Stellenbosch uh, for the Southern Hemisphere harvest, Zelma and Phil approached me and uh, they asked if I, if I wanted to be the winemaker for Villafonte. And I really, I, I didn't turn back. So yeah, I suppose the, the rest is history. For sure. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, intriguing people uh, with, uh, at the heart of Villafonte. Uh, a really great story. Um, but first things first, Let's turn towards what's happening in South Africa. Uh, as uh, any uh, viewer has, uh, has seen with these IGTVs that I've done, um, South Africa has been hit fairly hard as far as the wine industry is concerned. Uh, it, it had a countrywide kind of global shutdown for the pandemic. You had uh, an export uh, ban and then there was a ban on alcohol sales, at least the first time the, the president got on uh, the news and said, all right, you've got about three or four days to figure this out. And then it sh shut down. Uh, that was overturned um, about five, six, six weeks ago now. And then, um, or it was uh, overturned uh, relatively quickly. But then now you have basically a countrywide prohibition. The president got on the news and said, starting immediately, no more sales of alcohol. Uh, how, how are you doing? How are you doing right now? And how's, how, how's this sense of how South Africa is doing as a whole for the, for the wine trade? I suppose it, it is tough uh, knowing that we, we're, we were never sure uh, when this prohibition law would, would uh, come to an end. Mm -hmm. But um, Villafonte as a whole, our team are positive. We're optimistic. Um, this too shall shall come to pass and um we're really growing closely and and looking at innovations within our within our uh company mm -hmm. and uh, yeah looking looking to the future for sure for sure yeah i've got a uh, i've got a quite a few psalm friends there um and you know they're they're starting to kind of scrape bottom uh, since restaurants have been hit really hard the wine industry has been hit really hard you're looking at really tens of billions of rons uh, in lost sales, uh, which equates to hundreds of millions of pounds and dollars. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, my heart goes out to you guys. I, you know, I can't say enough uh, good things about, about you guys. And I, I hope that uh, everything turns around rather quickly, sooner than later, to, to get it back up and running. Because South Thank Africa you. needs a little bit of love right now, clearly. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, with the story of uh, Villafonte, you know, Zimalong, uh, Mike Ratcliffe, Dr. Phil Fries, um, a lot of interesting people, a lot of different ideas, a lot of talents. Um, talk to us about how Villafonte kind of came to be and why the location was uh, chosen for the 42 uh, hectare estate uh, and where, why it exists there today. So just interrupt me if I, if I forget any of those points. But uh, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> So, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a fascinating story. Um, so starting with, with the three partners, um, each one an expert in their own field. So a, a unique project in, sure. in that you've got a winemaking partner, uh, a wine growing partner, and, and Phil Fries is a doctor of um, uh, viticulture and with a speciality in, in soil microbiology. Selma Long, uh, arguably one of the, the best known and, and loved winemakers, women winemakers in the world and an absolute icon to, to so many. And um, our very own South African, uh, Mike Ratcliffe, and uh, an absolute whiz in, in the, the wine business. Mm -hmm. So what better partnership than, uh, than these three? For sure. Uh, so in, in terms of the, uh, the synergy of, of when and timing, um, I suppose the, the project came about after the, the abolishment of um, apartheid. So early, early on in, in uh, what, is, what was it, 1996, um, South Africa was looking to the outside world and trying to find a good way to um, you know, look at uh, what the rest of the world was doing. It, it was very closed. Mm -hmm. So, um, what was it? The uh, South African Airways was looking at uh, hosting a, a wine competition and they asked some international, uh, well, experts in, in wine to come in and judge the, the competition. So Zelma Long came in and uh, judged the, the competition. Phil Fries, I, I believe, came with her on that trip and they really fell in love with the country. So at that stage, they weren't necessarily looking at buying a property, but... Um, I believe it was uh, Michael Beck of Backsburg uh, approached them at that stage. Sorry, Sydney Beck. Um, and uh, said, wouldn't they be interested in uh, going into a partnership? Mm -hmm. So he, he came to, to Phil Fries with, um, with this piece of property and um, said, well, what do you think? And I believe Phil's first, uh, 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 his, um, Sorry, but reaction was, you must be mad. Uh, this is a really <laughs> tough piece of soil. Yeah. And so they did intensive studies on, on the soil using ground penetrating radar, uh, infrared spectroscopy, uh, spectral imaging on, on the soil. Um, and they found this to be uh, the most ancient soil known to man. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful synergy in that later on when they made wine from this property, they didn't actually know what to call the wines. So I think the three partners initially, uh, they had many late nights uh, enjoying many bottles of wine and going back and forth. <laughs> and I believe it was Mike's wife, uh, Pip, that, that told them, well, come on, go home. Uh, the answer is right in front of you. Uh, the, the soil on the property is called Villafontes. Why didn't you call it Villafonte? So it came about so easily. Mm -hmm. awesome. I believe the list, the list is, is long of the, yeah. the options. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So um, we have some, uh, some bottles to try. Um, so we've got, uh, I've, I was sent uh, three bottles. Uh, we have just time for two. Uh, so we've got the Seriously Old Dirt, 2017. We also have, I have the 2017 uh, Villafonte Series C. So yeah, there's uh, 
there's these guys there. So the Seriously Old Dirt 2017. And then um, we have the Villavante Series C. I've got the 2017. Unfortunately, you don't have the 17. You've got the 18. So we can talk about the differences Perfect. and uh, the, the expression uh, between the two vintages and, and all that fun stuff. So let's, uh, let's just go ahead and uh, begin with the 2017 Serious, uh, Seriously Old Dirt. Uh, this is a blend of 37% Malbec. Uh, 36% Merlot, 26% Cab Sauv, and 1% Cab Franc. Um, this is also, this is technically your first vintage back as head winemaker. Is this, is this correct? It is correct. Yeah, correct. 2017. So, so talk about the vintage and um, your, any challenges or successes that you, you had with this wine. So 2017 was coming off the back of a, a real drought uh, vintage tough vintage and um, I suppose everyone was looking to uh, consolidate what they had but luckily in, in late 2016 we had fantastic rains and that set us up for a beautiful vintage come 2017. Um, so bud burst was really even we had really good conditions during flowering um, so at Villafonte we, we love to take down a lot of data and um, mm. our flowering window was largely within three days. Nice. So the, the tighter your, your flowering window is, uh, the better concentration in your final whites, mm. the, the more even you're ripening. So the 2017 vintage was set up uh, for a really good concentration. And uh, coming off that drought vintage 2016, we had um, an abundant crop and really beautiful conditions so uh, the nights weren't, weren't too warm because we, we have um, a lesser diurnal swing than seen in the Northern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And um, daytime temperatures didn't reach the highs that we can sometimes reach. So really a beautiful uh, vintage. Awesome. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the gist of my report for um, you know, 16, 17 was, you know, 16, 17, although is still technically a, a drought vintage, uh, 16 was considerably tough. And since wine makers and wine growers had somewhat of a somewhat of a fresh experience coming off of such a drought vintage, 17 became uh, far easier to handle uh, overall yeah. than than 16. And 17 came off really, really, really tasty. Awesome. And yeah, uh, this. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say the 2017 vintage, I, I suppose, coming off to the 2015, which is a really powerful vintage and good internationally. Um, our 2017s, we're incredibly proud of that elegance, but they have power as well. It's mm -hmm. understated power. For sure. Yeah. So talk to, about, talk to us about why you make the Series Soul Dirt at this price point. I mean, clearly with the other two bottlings, the Series M and the Series C, they are considerably higher. Um, what is Absolutely. your goal when, when creating and crafting this wine? So the Series L Dirt, it comes into the, the perfect model of being a second wine. Uh, oftentimes during blending of our Series wines, our Series M and C, which are our flagship wines, uh, we'll have proportions that don't quite fit into the... Uh, the main wines. So it's something that uh, it comes of, its, of itself. It's, it's the wines that we can't quite fit, but they're made with no less attention to detail. It's just the wines that um, we can't fit into the, the series wines. So technically declassified then. Still good, good drink, Correct. but goes into a uh, more accessible uh, price point. Uh, that's Correct. beautiful, delicious, and food friendly. Awesome. All right, cool. Um, any other uh, items you'd like to talk about the 2017 Series C Old Dirt before we move on to the Series C uh, 2017 and 2018, respectively? Sure. Um, so I suppose the, the 2017 saw quite a, a large um, proportion of Malbec and Merlot. And our long-term average is actually a, a cab-driven blend, although only marginally so. So it, it was, a, it was re reminiscent of the vintage. We had... Uh, vines that bore well in the Malbec and Merlot. Mm -hmm. And um, even so, uh, it, it gives that plushness, that lovely characteristic of, of our seriously old dirt. It's meant to be 
fruit pure. Um, it also has that just a, a hint of oak. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I get I, I get this nice minerality through the through the bin palette, and it adds this nice texture and yep. complexity on the finish. It's almost like being on a roller coaster and having that little kind of dip. It's like, it's like wee! It's really really fun, Stacy. And that minerality is is something of a signature for for the the state wines. It's, <laughs> for sure. it's something that just comes through year on year. For sure, yeah. That's that's one thing that I've always found intriguing about South African wine as a whole is it literally is home to um, you know, the oldest um, geological uh, minerality that uh, vines are physically grown into, and they're they're so unique and. Uh, sometimes misunderstood so let's uh let's, let's go into the uh Bilavante series c so i've got the 2017 and you have 2018 i have 2018 so 2017 <laughs> is is the uh the current vintage and 2018 i've i've got the unique um i suppose responsibility of coming up with tasting them. right and uh i took this we we've, we've um uh, got a release coming up, but it's it's just preparing for that. So I'm I'm putting together my tasting notes. I'll send that to the the team and see what they think. But um, awesome. I thought it would be fun to uh, see what's coming in in the wine uh, for sure. In our <laughs> for sure. So for the 17 series C, it's um, of course C standing for um, you know, Cabernet base. Uh, Correct. So We've got 57% Cabernet here, 21% Merlot, 13% Cab Franc, and 9% Malbec. Uh, what is the blend on the 18? The 18 is highly similar. Um, I suppose the, the percentages, they come after. They're, they're a happy yeah. mistake uh, after blending. It's, uh, or a happy surprise, rather. Um, we're really blending to the style, our house style. And um, my only, or our only, um, prerequisites are that Series C remain Cabernet dominant mm -hmm. and um, Series M be Merlot and Malbec dominant. So it's it's more of a, um, a house style that we're after. So in terms of the 2018, it's 58% Cab, mm -hmm. slightly higher. Uh, it was 11% Cab Franc, which is the other uh, Cabernet in there. Merlot 17 and Malbec 14%. Cool. Awesome. Cool. So um, let's let's just taste them side by side, and uh, it'd be kind of fun just to see what I get, see what you get. And again, same bottling, but different vintages. So correct. Yeah. And there's always a a plushness to this wine, with firm oak that is textured, layered, and silky. The minerality and there's this kind of crunchy, rocky, kind of crystal, um, you know, crystalline, almost like when you when you crunch on like rock salt, it's like that kind of crunchy, but it's not physically crunchy, but it's like has that bite to it. Very long Absolutely. finish. Um, very fresh, elegant, velvety fruits. Uh, it's all in the black category uh, with you know, blackberry, uh, dark red. Uh, Plum, um, cassis, which is a juicy current, a bit of tobacco, juicy tobacco, sage, Stacy. What uh, what do you get with the 2018? Absolutely. So, I suppose one of the the characteristics of the Series C is that real black fruit drive, and um, the minerality comes through year on year. It's something that we we look for in blending. So it it really has to maintain that deep dark fruit drive, but also, while maintaining an understated profile, it's it's not a hugely showy wine. Uh, a lot of people open it expecting this bombshell opulent wine. It's it's made in a, a more restrained um, for sure profile. So that's really something that we're looking for during blending. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the the entry at this stage, it's quite quiet. Uh, really lovely dense black fruit. Twenty eighteen. Mm -hmm. And I like to call it the, the Phoenix vintage. Mm. It was incredibly dry conditions, uh, came off of a, a good uh, wet vintage. And um, so from 2017, we went into this 
intense drought and uh, we had, was it 60% of our uh, normal crop. So yeah. it's 40% reduction. Smallest berries we've ever seen, uh, less than a gram per berry. So about 25% reduction in berry size. Wow. Uh, really lovely intensity of, of fruit flavor. So that black fruit, um, yeah, I suppose less is more. It's <laughs> Yeah, the French have uh, you know the, the great saying of it takes uh, miserable grapes to make great wine, and uh, or once you have that kind of reduction in the berry size, and you stress the grapes out to an extent, you you end up concentrating all that flavor, and the wine typically will benefit from 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 these conditions. So I. I greatly look forward to uh, sampling the 2018 as soon as it, uh, it can be uh, shipped out. But yeah, Sounds good. Awesome. Uh, so talk to us about the, um, the, the Series C. What, what are your expectations um, when looking at the fruit, when making the wine, when aging, um, everything during Elevage? What, what are your expectations uh, for, for the wine? So I suppose um, I'll, I'll start with the actual winemaking. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes there are, there are these traditional blocks that go to the Series C and the Series mm -hmm. M. And uh, to expand on that, initially the project saw uh, a vision of having only one wine. So one brand van. Mm -hmm. And um, during the initial vintage, uh, 2002 was actually declassified. It was... Um, it was a good experimental vintage, uh, but declassified. So Zelma saw instead of one uh, style, there were conflicting styles. So instead of losing that resolution, um, she blended two separate wines, one more juicy, more plush, uh, a fruit forward wine. And that came to be the Series M. And uh, Series C had a, a much more dark fruit drive. It was more intense. Um, something that one puts away and uh, it, it really rewards after time opening up. And that was cab dominant. So uh, it came later uh, with the C and the M denoting mm. uh, Cabernet. And uh, in, in terms of the, the Series C, um, obviously it's got four of the Bordeaux varietals and um, that we have certain blocks that, that lend themselves to each of these blends. Like there's, there's a Merlot uh, on the property. And if you imagine this pretty small property, it's only 42 hectares, 16 hectares that are planted. It's like uh, taking a piece of paper and gently folding it. Yeah. It's, it's a flat piece of land on the bench of uh, the Simonsburg mountain. Mm -hmm. And um, so most of our Cabernets are planted on the one side of the property. And there's this one Merlot that's kind of looking across the, the fold. And uh, it's, it's got a bit of a, a identity crisis. It thinks it's cab. <laughs> so, yeah. And um, this is our, our Z block, Zelma's uh, favorite Merlot. Nice. And uh, it, every year, it, it just screams Series C. So we, we, we have a good idea going into winemaking uh, mm -hmm. where they'll land up. And uh, we actually blend uh, roughly at eight months after, after vintage. So blending fairly early on, but we found that eight months after vintage is a, is a sweet spot for us. You have that roller coaster of um, oak flavors coming up at about plus minus month six. Uh, and then at month eight, it's a, it's a really good time to have a horizontal tasting through everything. Sure. We'll have... 18 parcels that are individually uh, vented and um, will then further resolve into anywhere between 50 and 70 samples uh, during blending. Amazing. It's good to have all those tools to work with and figure out and fine tune exactly what, what the blend will need um, every, every year. It's Absolutely. Cool. So it's, it's somewhat like a, a painter's palette. Exactly. <laughs> I had that uh, analogy, uh, I think it was last week. Um, so with the Villapante, it, it, the, there's just a few bottlings in the range. Uh, are there any interest in adding any more labels to the brand by chance? That's actually pretty simple. Um, 
we started out with a focus mm -hmm. uh, to make one wine. And uh, <clears throat> if anything, in 2012, we in introduced our second wine. And um, if anything, we'll actually simplify. We might eventually, if, if the vineyard permits, we'll go to one wine and a second wine. Interesting. So the Series M will essentially go away and the Series Z will go away? Well, only time will tell. There's, uh, there's no timeline involved. And um, I'm just saying, we'll, we'll never expand on, on the three. It might simplify to only two wines. Gotcha. Awesome. Interesting. Yeah, when, when, uh, when trying the wines last year for uh, the last year's South Africa report, um, you, you can see the clarity and the intention and the quality of the wine. C, uh, Series C speaks for itself. It's, it's one of those great wines you try, you're like, okay, this is, this, is, this is something I can put in my cellar and I can age it for a couple decades and feel all right, it's still going to be good. Um, you know, the Series M, looking at it from a standpoint of like, you have a cab dominant blend and a low dominant blend, you start to see the laterals between, um, you know, the Bordelais houses. Well, one side is cab dominant, one side is Merlot dominant. Um, and then the clever thing to do is to have a bottling that is basically declassified, still good quality, but it hits the price point where people can uh, take a chance on that bottling and realize it's good and then take the next step and go up to the series classes, the M and C. Um, Absolutely. There's, I, I know there's only limited land uh, that you can plant on. Uh, would there be possibly any other varietals you'd want to add into the repertoire of what's being grown on the property? I, I, I don't think we uh, would ever expand on the planting in, in terms of varietals. We've found mm -hmm. what works for us. Um, I know many people ask us about Petit Verdot, and mm -hmm. it's somewhat of a newcomer within mm -hmm. Bordeaux, within their history. So mm -hmm. um, it was also introduced to, to give greater freshness uh, and color and um, both of which we, we really don't need a surplus of in, in our wines. So it's, uh, they give you that lovely color and freshness all on their own. For sure, for sure, yeah. Petit Verdot, it can also be a double-edged sword. Just a little bit can go a long way. And it can, it, it, it to me, has a tendency to make the wine more tannic than it yep. ultimately needs to be. Um, yep. People think it's, really used for color uh, mostly, but it adds a very uh, tight structure and adds to the, to the backbone of what the wine is all about. And I, I, I find that there's a large number of producers just across the globe that use, use Petit Verdot incorrectly or too much. It's like salt yeah. and pepper. Too much will go, um, will, will ruin everything. Just a little bit will go a long way. And uh, there's only been a few producers that have dialed it in perfectly. Um, and I was thinking, I was like, you know, there is no Petit Verdot in these blends. And what would that do? And thinking about how the profile is, how the structure is, I, I don't necessarily think it needs it. If, if, if anything, maybe to the M, just like 1% or 2%. But at that point, it, it would be a moot point. So I, I, think, I think you're doing everything right. Awesome. I think... So. Petit Verdot within the South African milieu, also uh, from, from those that I've tasted, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes some, some incredible varietal wines, but sure. uh, the profile in, it, in its own just doesn't quite fit our signature. It's, yeah. They have a really heady perfume, uh, really rose petal, lovely mm -hmm. rich red flavors, but uh, it, it doesn't seem to fit within our profile. So it's, it's not something that we would consider. Nice, nice. I, uh, I, I agree. Um, so with, um, let's see, is there any thoughts uh, into growing the production in bottling? I mean, you, you've, you've talked about possibly gr sizing down your bottlings. Would that yep. mean that you would increase your bottlings overall uh, into more, creating more C and more um, seriously old dirt? Or would you keep production the same for those two and just fine tune and increase the quality? I suppose the, the beauty of the property is it, it's been over a long term, it, it's been quite consistent uh, in production volumes. Um, 
and we, we have over time we've planted more and more um, but it's it's been at a slow pace we we have 42 hectares and um, I suppose it's it's limited by by water constraints within South Africa uh, climate change is real so we we have to take that into consideration as well but it's it's more of a, a passive growth so yes we uh, this year actually we're planting a further two uh, hectares of cap. And um, it's going to take time to uh, develop into a series wine. From our experience, usually at, at year five, um, you'll, you'll have your first wines that show concentration. It will mm. still go up and down in terms of stylistic um, expression. And then from, say, year seven, you'll have more consistency. But... Um, Another another uh, interesting fact about 2018, it was the first crop from a new planting in 2014. So mm -hmm. oftentimes your, your first crop from a young vineyard, you'll also have that lovely intensity. And we, we ended up using roughly 25% of those young wines. That's awesome. Cool. Um, so when creating the Series M, uh, that's uh, Merlot Malbec base blend, uh, is there anything particular that you are looking for when creating that wine? Absolutely. So it's it's really meant to have more of a seductive, luscious uh, feel on, on the palate. It's, mm -hmm. it's got a, a plushness, but uh, on, on the mid palate, it has this succulent core that is really luscious. So uh, Malbec tends to have these incredibly fine tannins um, and they, they kind of come up after the fact. Uh, I don't know if it's a good e expression, but they're kind of like ghost tannins. Um, after you've swallowed, you, you have this lovely wafting lithe feeling. So this is something that's developed over time in our Series M. Um, 2009 was our first crop from uh, another second tranche of, of planting of Malbec. And before that time, um, Series M was always Merlot. There was one plant, uh, one vintage of Cab dominant, but um, up until then, it was it was Merlot dominant. So, 2009 came around, and Malbec yielded these beautiful wines. And uh, I suppose since then, we've we've had the odd vintage where Malbec has been vying for pole position in in the Series M blend. So, mm -hmm. luckily, uh, first letter. M, so both M and M. So it still works. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I, I find that uh, the profiles of Malbec and Merlot, um, a, as a whole, I think they tend to drive together better than Merlot and Cab, um, where Merlot and Cab, they, they tend to be complementary, where they tend to um, kind of work off each other, where I find that Malbec and Merlot are kind of on the same wavelength and they only give each other uh, more precision, more power, more finesse. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's one thing I love about a really good Merlot or a really good Malbec. And you know, here in the States, it's, it's a really weird thing where, um, you know, we had a movie that tanked Merlot sales. And the, the funny thing was, is had America been paying attention, the very last bottle, the, uh, the Cheval Blanc 61 was, yeah. Is, is you know Merlot from from Bordeaux. Uh, yeah. The interesting thing that I find currently about Napa Merlot is that there's actually currently more Merlot planted in Napa than there was before the uh, the movie. Unfortunately, most of that Merlot is being blended into something else, and it doesn't make its way to the front of the label as yeah. a single bottle of Merlot. Uh, but yeah, Merlot. Merlot is, is a wonderful, beautiful grape, and it should, uh, should be appreciated more. Um, so, yeah. Cool. So for, uh, for um, Cersei Old Dirt, uh, how did that come to be, ultimately? Um, what was the first vintage, and how many, how many like, what was, what, was the, what was the focus behind it, of course, um, you know, it being declassified? Uh, but what, what was the intention ultimately be behind it when it was first uh, first started? Well, I suppose it, it became quite, it was a passive growth. Um, 2012 was the first vintage. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really a, a wine that came out of um, a quest 
from our members, uh, a request for something to, to drink early. Mm -hmm. uh, because oftentimes we'll, we'll encourage our, our members to drink one bottle, you know, store the rest of the wines and, and enjoy the, the evolution of our wines. So they were asking, well, can you recommend something that's um, easy drinking and, and good for now? So mm -hmm. we had this surplus of wines that weren't quite making it into, into our um, series wines, uh, either proportionally or just it didn't fit to, to the style. So, um, yeah, it, the rest is history. We, in 2012, we made a very small bottling. It was mm -hmm. 6,000 bottles and uh, that was consumed pretty quickly. And then just slowly but surely, we've, we've built that, um, I suppose, consolidated. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a growing uh, product line now. Cool. I like that. It's the, pretty much the same idea between, you know, Rosso and Brunello. You know, Rosso is what you drink while you're aging your Brunellos in the cellar. So. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so are there any varietals that you'd like to work with over your career? So I'd... My real passion is is for Bordeaux varietals, and uh, I I think I've I've found my my happy place. My my biggest challenge and and biggest um, accomplishment, or I, I feel the happiest when I get it right, is Malbec. It's mm. it's actually quite tricky to to get it right. Mm. Um, it has a a tendency to to want to go to a reductive style, uh, somewhat like Syrah, and um, it's also got these huge tannins if you if you over extract it. So it's yeah. you have to handle it with kit gloves, but not. It gives amazing color, but it's not necessarily the most stable color. So it's it's one of these grapes that I'm I'm still learning the ropes with. But it's it's hugely satisfying when you when you get it right. For sure, for sure, awesome. Um, so, um, what do you ultimately hope to achieve over your career? Like what, what do you hope to be known for? Well, um, I suppose it's, that's an easy one. I'd, I'd like to make wines that, that make people sit up and, and take note. That's, that's the easy answer. That's awesome. So my pleasure really comes from, from other people's enjoyment. So it's, it's an easy answer. Awesome. I can I can relate to, relate to that for sure. Uh, where, where ultimately do you see uh, Villavante in, in say twenty years time? Well, I suppose I I alluded to to the fact that um, if anything, we might consolidate the the series wines, mm -hmm. but uh, there there's no timeline or time horizon. Um, we'll find find a home. So currently, uh, we have we focused from from the ground up our focus was purely on, on the vineyards. And mm -hmm. uh, eventually we will find a, a property that's suitable to, to build a home, uh, build a, a winery from the ground up, and then also really focus on, on giving love to, to our wine club members uh, because they, they support us so avidly. So uh, tailoring an experience to, to our wine club members. Oh, awesome. So would there, since you necessarily can't really expand the property, do you foresee um, Villafante growing and purchasing property near where you're located or outside to create a um, more plantable area to have more grapes to play with ultimately? Or you want to keep it? Or do you think Villafante will remain just where it is at the, at the base of the Swedensburg and not have additional parcels? So I think for, for the series wines, um, that'll definitely, it, it'll remain an estate wine. So our single parcel of land, we know how special that soil is and it's, it's pretty rare within the Western Cape. Mm -hmm. um, something unique about the Western Cape is uh, over a distance of a couple meters, you'll, you'll have variations within the subsoils. So finding a piece of land that has fairly homogeneous pockets uh, of this Villafonte soil and then planting individual parcels on these uh, on these soils. Uh, that's really where our uh, devotion is to the series wines. Mm -hmm. And um, if anything, the growth will come in in the seriously old dirt, um, and that'll be same team, same attention to detail, but uh, growing in volumes. 
since Villafonte does uh, focus with the Bordeaux varietals, um, Bordeaux also makes white wine. Uh, do you foresee um, Sauvignon Blanc ever on property in the future? I love Sauvignon Blanc. Um, it's as you said, it's it's a Bordeaux varietal, but um, I'll leave that specificity to another winemaker ha that has that absolute passion. My my passion is for reds, yeah. and um, I'm sure uh, you can appreciate that. Oh, for sure. So yeah. focus is is number one. Yeah, Stellenbosch is uh, very well known for red as a whole, and with the you know, creation of the um, Stellenbosch Cabernet Collective. Um, there's there's a serious push not only in marketing but in quality, and even though Cabernet necessarily isn't the um, the the most uh, planted there, there's there, there, there's clearly a quality um, on or, uh, clearly a focus on quality of, of those wines. They have a sincerity and precision to, to them that um, is is very um, very delicious and to have a collective voice such as the Stellenbosch Cabernet Collective I think I was gonna uh, it's one of, the, one of the smartest things that Stellenbosch as a whole could do to say you know here's what we're here's what we're doing but here's what we're known for and this is the quality and it's 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 a very smart thing yeah. really focused um Gain traction for for the um, for the region. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Growing brand Stonebush. Sure, awesome. Um, so, how do you see South African wine being more impactful uh, in the global wine market? Well, that's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a loaded question. Yeah. Um, South Africa really has to to maintain our our exports to well. Yeah. gain access to to export markets well the outside world um, thankfully that sanction was lifted uh, post apartheid and uh, again now during lockdown at least we're still able to to export so mm -hmm. yeah maintaining exports is important um, in terms of marketing i I suppose Stellenbosch cab collective is is a really good um, platform to, to grow brand South Africa. Mm. And again, that shows specificity. It's um, producers that are trying to zone in on, on a focus. And um, while many people do produce uh, a portfolio of wines, I, I believe if South Africa starts to trust in their, their young winemakers to, to focus on one thing that they're really good at um, and believe in that, then that's going to grow brand South Africa, grow the quality and grow the brand. That's right. Do you see the price of South African wines as a whole uh, increasing over time? I suppose, yes, they are. Uh, but South Africa has always been seen as, as a great value from, uh, for money market. So it, it's right. been difficult because oftentimes once you've pegged at a at a certain level, it's it's tough to break that mold. Break away. Yeah. So there, there are a few um, companies that that are definitely breaking that mold. But um, yeah, it's it's an exciting trajectory for for the industry. For sure, that was uh, was one of my last kind of parting thoughts about the uh, on my last reports, saying that um, you know currently South African wine is at its best quality that it's been ever. Um, but the the prices need to increase because the farmers need yep. to get paid, the growers need to get paid, the winemakers need to be paid. Um, th there's a large majority, I think it's 85% roughly of South African wine that sells for about 45 rand, uh, which is about $3 American. You cannot yeah. sustain an entire industry on $3 a bottle. So part of the unfortunate predicament that overall South Africa has has become to be known as is a value um, a, a value brand um, country where there is these bottles are are really inexpensive but there's really good quality out there the way that 
I think South Africa has to move forward is that the wines ultimately have to become more expensive because you have growers who are who have been pulling up their vineyards in order to plant other crops so they can make money. It's yep. it's yep. not something that they necessarily want to do, but they need to make money. It's still a business. And if you can't be successful, that's something that's that's unfortunate. So ultimately what will ha need to happen is that South Africa is going to have to fire some drinkers and say, I'm sorry, we're not on the price point, price point anymore. Yeah. Um, now we're at 450, now we're $6. We're still just as good. If that happens from the consumer standpoint, the quality has to get better. So which means price goes up, quality has to go up. Um, there are hands down a, a, you know, a, a solid handful of thoughtful, top quality minded and focused winemakers making fantastic wine that competes at the um, ultra premium levels that are making just fantastic wines. And Villavante is um, clearly in that, in that upper echelon of the, the top producers. And uh, you don't need me to tell you that you're making fantastic wine. That's I mean, just stick your nose in this class and, and you know, you're doing the right thing. But overall, it, it's, it's like that saying, it's like, if you want to go uh, far, you know, go by yourself. But if you want to, or if you want to go fast, go, go by yourself. If you want to go far, you need to go. go together. So ultimately it's one of those things where <laughs> with current situations with the pandemic, it, it seems like South Africa is kind of on, on a crutch where it's only sales can be, uh, are, happening for, are happening for South Africa are the export sales over overseas. Uh, or yes. outside the country, um, it you know you sit there and you you think about it, you wonder like there there's some serious problems, um, and you know I've been trying to keep track of all the different um, producers. I mean, there's been over eighty, probably eighty to one hundred and twenty producers that have they're just they're done they're they're gone because of this pandemic, right. and that's you know that that's that's a real real tragedy because you know they 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 couldn't sustain it. Um, and that's that's part of the challenge for South Africa right now is there needs to be um, some serious investment happening at the right places. And I, ultimately, I think uh, South Africa um, could could have you know, better marketing um, overall. I mean, with with my coverage of South Africa, uh, I tasted uh, wide and deep, and it took me a long time to get my report out. And there's still a handful of of producers. Um, that I, I still need to get out. Um, but with that, tasting as wide and as deep as I did, uh, I, I literally left no stone unturned. And I searched and searched and searched. And South Africa, it, it's, it's clearly making good quality wine and as, as a whole. But ultimately, I think the hardest crunch is still yet to come. I think with this pandemic, it's, it's exposing a lot of um, kind of weak points in the overall um, system of, of the, the wine industry, but it's going to be producers um, like yourself and other, other producers who are quality minded that will remain relatively unscathed and uh, come out still victoriously but it's, 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 it's a battle and it's, it's, it's happening. It is. Yeah. It is. So what would you, what, what would you say to any, um, you know, younger winemakers or growers that during now experiencing everything that we've, we've, uh, we've experienced to this point, what would you tell them um, into, into uh, you know, giving them some inspirational uh, information about, the 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 overall industry for for south africa so i suppose there's no way of sugarcoating it these are tough times yeah but the beautiful thing is uh we will come come out of this um and uh we'll emerge stronger there might be fewer brands but south africa as a as a, a whole will come out stronger um and I suppose in terms of uh, young students that are studying wine, yes, 
go on, finish your studies. There, there is definitely a place uh, for young winemakers and, and the excitement is um, that the transformation is, is coming from young winemakers. Um, and then in terms of wine style, I, I think some of the beauty of South African wine is that we have our own identity and we should own that. Yeah. Um, we, we are an old world uh, winemaking country with well over 300 years, 360 something odd years of winemaking experience. Mm -hmm. So yes, we're old world, uh, but in terms of the, the wealth of our terroir, it expresses in, in a beautiful fruit expression. Uh, it's maybe not as, as tertiary as, as a lot of old world wines, nor as opulent as, um, as uh, the American wines. So it, it has its own identity and I think we as producers need to embrace that. Awesome. Uh, I know it's getting late there. It's uh, close to 11 p.m. your time. I'm sure it's uh, getting past your bedtime. Uh, so it won't keep you much longer. Um, you mentioned that, um, you know, you could, that producers can kind of take this time to better position themselves uh, during this pandemic um, now that things are kind of shut down. Um, yep. Are you or Vilvante uh, doing anything this year? Uh, during the pandemic to better position yourself for 2021 moving forward? I suppose, yeah, it, everyone is having to look at uh, current legislation and, and looking at how, how better to protect your team. So definitely, um, because we're such a hands-on uh, team during harvest, it's, uh, we rely on, on a small team of, of hand sorting. So yes, in, in terms of how to protect our team, um, and then as management team, we're also trying to uh, distance at this time. Mm -hmm. But even, even with Hard people working quickly, I, I believe our team is stronger. Um, we're you know, building on innovations. And uh, yeah, I, I believe we're going to come through the stronger. Awesome. I believe it. Um, is there anything that you want to tell the world? Um, any last you know, words or parting thoughts? Uh, that you might have kind of just thought of during during these uh, these tough times. So certainly we all need to keep safe. Uh, look after your fellow man by by um, trying to uh, distance oneself. Uh, so keep safe um, during this time. Explore the world of wine. It's a magical world. Right. And uh, for for those tuning in from international markets, please buy South African wines. <laughs> um, awesome. Good plug. Um, awesome. So thank you so much for spending uh, an hour over your, uh, your evening. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. And uh, I look forward to checking out that 2018 scene. There you were. Awesome. So until then, um, keep, uh, keep it locked here. I will be spending all of August uh, chatting with the kind of new up and comers of, of my regions for South Africa and Washington State. Uh, some producers that uh, those outside of the US may not have uh, heard of and then new producers um, that uh, the US maybe hasn't had uh, heard of uh, as far as uh, South African wines and producers. So till then, stay safe, drink well, and be kind to others. Thank you, Anthony. Cheers. Pleasure, Chris. Have a good night. <laughs> you too.